Thank you, Sean. Um, we, good afternoon, everyone. We're very excited um, to have a great group of presenters this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And we will be ha uh, having a web conference focused on the personal health information management needs of consumers and their informal caregivers and implications for consumer health IT design. Um, the presenters will be discussing preliminary results from their grant projects, um, which were all funded under the same funding opportunity. Before we get started, though, I'd like to start with some housekeeping items. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, none of the presenters or myself have any financial disclosures um, to share with you or any conflicts of interest. Um, as Sean mentioned, we will be using the Q&A feature to submit questions. You can submit questions throughout the presentations, and we will hold all questions to the end. And I just wanted to quickly go over some of the learning objectives. Um, as I said, we have three presenters this afternoon. The first presentation will be focusing on the information needs of hospitalized patients and their caregivers. Uh, the second presentation on a project um, looking at the development of reminders for patients with type 2 diabetes and mothers of children with asthma. And the third presentation will be focusing on the layout of um, individuals' homes and implications for, for design. So uh, first off this afternoon, we have uh, Dr. Wanda Pratt, who is professor in the information school with an adjunct appointment in the Division of Biomedical and Health Informatics in the medical school at the University of Washington. She received her PhD in medical informatics from Stanford University, her master's degree in computer science from the University of Texas, and her bachelor's in electrical engineering and computer engineering from the University of Kansas. Her research focuses on understanding patients' needs and designing new technologies to address those needs. She has worked with people coping with a variety of chronic diseases such as cancer, diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. Her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the National Library of Medicine, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Robert Johnson Foundation, Intel, and Microsoft. Dr. Pratt is a fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics. So Dr. Pratt, if you'd like to get us started. Great, thank you, Teresa. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about our most recent grant focusing on the needs of inpatients in acting as safeguards to prevent um, medical errors. So I'll first start with um, a discussion about patient safety. Um, it's been a known problem for a long time in the U.S. that uh, there are, has been highlighted from reports from the Institute of Medicine um, in its report in 1999, as well as its report in 2001. And they've highlighted um, problems of uh, deaths as well as harms that can come to, to patients from medical errors. If you look at um, the most recent report from 2013, they estimate that over 440,000 people die a year in the U.S. alone from preventable medical errors. And that number is 10 to, 10 to 20 times higher once you take a look at um, serious harm that can come to patients. Um, so if you think about that in terms of airplanes, uh, the 440,000 deaths a year is a, equivalent to about seven airplanes crashing every single day in the U.S. alone. Um, if you think about the harm, it's really much more like a whole fleet of airplanes. If we think about um, prior work that's happened in terms of understanding patient safety, a lot of work has been done by James Reason in this area looking at the notion of hazards and presenting um, complicated work, such as healthcare, as something that's filled with lots of potential hazards. But the goal is to try and put up barriers in place to try and prevent um, those hazards from actually coming through as losses or medical errors that cause harm uh, and sometimes death to patients. A lot of work has been done um, already. Um, trying to understand this and take action, such as surgical checklists acting as barriers, um, medication barcodes acting as barriers. But as Reason noted, um, none of these are perfect, um, thus the Swiss cheese model. And our goal is to try and prevent 
to put in place enough barriers that hopefully don't have overlapping holes from the Swiss cheese um, to prevent the actual harms from happening. And in our project, our goal is to um, add recognizing patients and families as potential safeguards in uh, preventing these problems. So our work really looks at three key aims for trying to address this problem. One would be looking at ways in which we can increase the situational awareness of patients. And hopefully this awareness will help them understand and recognize potential safety problems as they come up. The second goal is to really help them to capture and manage health information so that they can um, gather needed information to um, notice and understand when an error is going to happen and then, or could happen. And then the third aim is really to look at supporting an active dialogue among the patients, the caregivers, and the healthcare providers to try and understand and communicate when there is a potential for, for error from the patient's perspective and um, support this in a good way to have it happen effectively and efficiently so that the healthcare providers can really understand what the, the patient's concerns are and also have an efficient way for them to act upon that and to really understand what's happening. So the way we are studying this and accomplishing our aims is we're investigating hospital patients and their caregivers. We're looking at uh, approximately half of the inpatients as coming from a medical um, admission and half coming from a surgical admission with a diversity of patients that's equivalent to the, the Seattle area. We're looking at this from both an adult hospital perspective from Virginia Mason as well as a children's hospital perspective from Seattle Children's Hospital. We're using a, a three-phase methodology of a lot of um, subjective and qualitative approach to deeply understanding the perspective of the, the patients and caregivers in this kind of situation, as well as incorporating some information from the clinical perspective. We include in the, the first phase of it, really interviewing and observing the patients, as well as following up with a more generalized survey. In the second round, we do um, participatory design with um, patients and caregivers, and use that in a third phase to really um, deploy to the patients in, in a low, uh, low fidelity type of way to help understand more deeply about their needs. We're currently in phase one of the first aim of our um, grant proposal, so we're really focusing on this notion of situational awareness. We've already interviewed um, 22 patients and 17 caregivers and observed um, their situations in the hospital. We also have done a survey of 157 people who've been an inpatient or caregiver, not necessarily, um, actually usually not in the same hospital settings that we've been doing the observations and interviews. We've also done um, a series of clinician observations, shadowing a variety of different healthcare professionals um, from a variety of different settings, from rounds to discharge, um, various care conferences and physical therapy types of sessions to understand both, um, both perspectives here. So far we have some initial results. Um, one focusing on our observation finding is we really found that the inpatient setting is a very poor information workspace for patients. Um, although if you look at the picture on the right, it looks like um, the empty room has lots of surfaces for the patient to interact with. However, if you look at the reality of the picture on the left, a lot of these surfaces are really covered in food, trash, um, phones, all kinds of information, uh, all kinds of stuff that get in the way of patients effectively using that information space. Thus, um, their smartphones and their computers are often not handy or they're, they're covered um, in other kinds of equipment. And thus the papers from the clinicians are often stacked by the window, um, away from handy reach from the patient. Although there are whiteboards in lots of hospital rooms, they're usually located on the opposite side of the bed and don't provide easy access to the patient. Some relevant quotes from our work. Um, we found one patient who said, 
most of it, the information, I scrawled it on the back of some pamphlets that came out of a box of dressings because I didn't have any paper. They did have a whiteboard in my room, so I could keep track of some of it there, but some of it was embarrassing, and I didn't want it available to be read by anyone who walked into the room. So that brings up some issues of privacy um, for any kind of information system we use to help um, patients uh, know what information is going on because uh, the patient doesn't necessarily know who's going to be coming into the room from their visitors to different kinds of hospital staff. Another quote which, which was interesting is looking at the EMR as a barrier. They said EMR eliminates ready review of what has been administered and when. It used to be that patients could um, pick up the chart in their room and take a look at some of the information, but with the EMRs in place, most of those charts have disappeared, and therefore patients don't have as, as easy access to some of the information that they used to have. We also found that the information environment, probably not surprising to you, is very provider-centric, but that has a lot of, of implications. In particularly, we found that patients actually had very little access to the information about their care. The information that they did get was primarily through verbal dialogue, yet a lot of research has shown that um, 40 to 80 percent of what is said verbally to patients is almost immediately forgotten. Um, that doesn't even count issues of um, typical kinds of cognitive impairment, um, sleep issues, stress that can contribute to um, even poorer memory and reliance on verbal information could be quite, um, quite challenging. Thus, there are many uh, information needs that are unmet um, from these patients and caregivers, such as the expected workflow, um, what to expect for what clinicians are going to come into the room when, what kinds of things are going to be happening to them when, as well as um, what we're calling this expected care activity and schedule. Thus, we found that patient and caregiver information work is largely unsupported in a hospital environment. We found a lot of barriers to the information exchange with patients um, from both perspectives, from the receiving perspective, some of the things I've talked about um, before, but also just the whole nature of hospital work is it's very much dispersed among many different um, departments from different perspectives, and the communication among them is challenging, um, which also reflects in, in the information that gets received from the patient's perspective, too. It's easy for them to get conflicting information, to see lots of changes in their care plan, or not see the changes that are coming up until it's a surprise to them. And that makes it very difficult for patients to keep track of and really um, act as safeguards in their own care if they really don't understand what's supposed to happen when. We've also uncovered a lot of issues with the patients supplying important information to the clinical care team. Um, a lot of patients talked about lost requests from um, asking for even simple requests like um, uh, adhering to a pain protocol that the patients requested, to getting a chair in the room for frequent visitors, um, as well as different kinds of, of social pressures and um, in terms of speed of interaction and feeling like clinicians don't have time to, to listen to them and for them to supply important information to their care team, as well as questions coming to them um, at possibly poor times, maybe when they're just recovering from anesthesia and can't think very clearly, or when some people are in the room that they maybe don't want to um, overhear some um, answers to questions or questions that they would like to pose to clinicians. So all of these barriers are a problem in um, people acting as, face as safeguards in their own care. We also have some results um, of surveys that that um, correspond with a lot of what we're seeing in the interviews and observations. For example, um, although most people thought they were uh, involved as much as they wanted in decisions about their care, over 35% of the people, which you can see in the red on the screen, felt they weren't as involved as they wanted to be. And over 35% also felt that they weren't able to stay as informed as they wanted about all the activities that were occurring in their care. There were also issues um, regarding communication and comfort level of the patient and communicating with doctors and nurses 
um, and really getting um, answers that they could understand. We also had survey results um, talking about how important and how difficult it is for them to get particular kinds of information. A lot of them talked about medications as being really um, highly important, um, as well as information more about what's going to happen to them next that I've circled here in purple, things like their expected next visit, um, their expected length of stay, and upcoming lab and image test schedules. Um, note that a large number of both patients and caregivers felt that this information was very important. And a substantial number of them, often more than half, particularly from the caregiver perspective, found that it was very difficult to get this information. That leads to a lot of frustrations, such as the one expressed by one of our participants. We spent a lot of time sitting around waiting for the doctors. Then we would go to the bathroom or get food and come back, and they would have been there without speaking with any of us. We would have to wait for a whole other day to ask our questions or share information or observations. And this kind of um, frustration was expressed frequently among our participants. We also um, surveyed them about keeping track of information to give back to the clinical care team about their, their care, um, talking about the importance and the difficulty. And note here that actually um, quite a few people felt it was important to keep track of a number of things, from questions from their care team to pain level, changes within their own um, symptoms and stress in particular. and. Um, a substantial number found it very difficult to keep track of this information um, and then provide it back to the clinical care team. The, the survey results talked about the reasons that they wanted to keep track of this information, and they ranged from really wanting to be an active participant and know and understand what's happening to explicitly mentioning that they wanted to um, monitor their care quality and, and active um, watching out for their own safety. They also hoped that this kind of tracking would improve their communication with the staff and help the staff and themselves um, cope with challenges that they experienced during their, their stay. They also found it very difficult to, um, to deal with so many different events occurring at the same time, and their hope was that the tracking would help them cope with this and be prepared for when there were upcoming visits with their, their clinical staff. They also found that tracking helped them um, comply with clinician requests um, so that they could understand, uh, keep track of whether or not they um, did the, the exercises that were requested or um, keep track of what they were doing. We also looked at what methods people were using to keep track of this information. And by and large, they were using a written form um, if they were able to to do anything at all other than memory or verbalizing that information or relying on a caregiver. A small percentage of people use any kind of an electronic means to keep track of information. Now we've um, talked about these results in a, in a generic sense from a conglomerate of people. I want to make it real by pulling in a real life example. So let's say we, we um, let's consider a real person, a guy who's come into the emergency room, who presents with um, atrial fibrillation. He presents with an EKG that came from an urgent, urgent care clinic that shows his heart rate as pretty low, 42, with a second degree AV block. Um, he start, his heart rate is starting to come up at this point. Um, and the, the clinical care team comes back and says, starts to give the patient um, a medication. The, the person's spouse um, confronts the person and says, what is, what is this medication and why is it? So they're told um, the medication is metropolol, um, a beta blocker, um, but that's all they're told. Um, the wife um, persists and says, okay, so wait, a beta blocker, isn't that gonna slow the heart rate? Um, are you sure that that's the right thing? Um, but the, the nurse persists and says, no, actually, it's really important that the patient take this medication right now um, to prevent a stroke. So the patient and the spouse comply. 
Unfortunately, metropolol is contraindicated in this particular situation. Any situation where the heart rate is lower than, than 45 or when there's a second or third degree heart block, which was the case for this particular patient. Um, unfortunately, this patient then um, crashed a few hours later and required, um, even though they were sent home and required um, readmission to the hospital and spent the next week in the cardiac intensive care unit. This example is very personal for me and emotional because this actually happened to my husband and I was the spouse in this particular situation. So even though um, this occurred after I wrote this grant proposal and was very well informed of the potential for medical errors, it still happened in this situation. Thus, even very well informed people could be um, substantially harmed. Fortunately, um, my husband did recover and everything is fine, but this is an example um, where he was just one of four to eight million people that were harmed on that same day as he was. This is a serious problem that really needs to be addressed. So we have some early lessons from this work. We really need to look at ways to provide information to increase the situational awareness of patients and their caregivers. And this goes beyond what's just in the patient portal. There was recently a JAMA article looking at some of um, inpatient um, needs, and they found that patients did find access to their patient portal helpful, but actually um, not as helpful as they had assumed, and actually found the patient portals not to be as helpful as they'd hoped for preventing medical errors. Patients really need to know other information about their care, what's supposed to happen to them when, what the plan is, to really act as good safeguards in their own um, healthcare setting. We need new ways to capture the information to help inform the care team as well as the patients. And we need good ways to support active dialogue among patients, caregivers, and providers to make that efficient and effective. So in the end, I just want to conclude to say that these subjective methods that we've been using, interviews, observations, surveys, are really critical for us uncovering these kinds of problems. We've discovered a large number of patient information work in the hospital that's very important for preventing these medical errors, but quite challenging and very poorly supported by the current environment. Thus, we really need to support this important work to provide an additional safeguard and prevent medical errors. So I'd like to acknowledge my great team of um, postdocs, physicians, and students who have um, helped us accomplish this work and are continuing to work with us. And if you have um, more questions about this work that don't get answered during this seminar, feel free to contact me um, at this email address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wanda. Before we continue, um, I wanted to remind folks that slides will be sent to all attendees following the web conference. They will also be made available on our website at healthit.ahrq.gov under the events section. Our second speaker this afternoon is Dr. James Ralston, who is an associate investigator at Group Health Research Institute and an affiliate associate professor in health services and biomedical and health informatics at the University of Washington. His research focuses on improving care of patients living with chronic conditions. Dr. Ralston practices internal medicine at Group Health Cooperative. Dr. Ralston? Well, thank you, Teresa. I'm going to move us uh, out of the hospital and into the home. I'm going to talk about an exciting project we're doing on patient reminders and notifications for common preventive and chronic care tasks. Um, in healthcare, we're facing some new challenges and opportunities in how we design these communications for patients and families. Well, we know reminders work. They are effective at helping people get the care they need and want. They alert people to schedule medical visits and obtain preventive care screenings and chronic care follow-up. We also have several good studies out there that compare different approaches to delivering those reminders to patients. But we're getting stuck in silos by thinking of these uh, reminders um, as uh, for single care tasks. Uh, the number of healthcare tasks has been growing, especially for patients living with chronic conditions. A 73-year-old man, for example, has more than 3,000 health management activities a year, which range from blood pressure and glucose monitoring 
to obtaining medical tests and vaccinations and managing their medications. We also have limited understanding about how to use these, uh, use our new communication tools, such as patient websites linked to electronic health records, or text messaging, or mobile phone applications. Uh, when we combine these with EHRs, um, they offer new opportunities for more frequent contact with patients and, um, and a more comprehensive set of messages. We also need to personalize reminders. Uh, for example, not every individual with diabetes should be trying to get their hemoglobin A1C under 7. And as our population grows older and individuals live with more and more chronic conditions, that need for personalization is only going to increase. Uh, and finally, it's federal policy for stage meaning to stage two of meaningful use. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services requires that more than 10% of providers, patients be sent a reminder according to patients' preferences. While there's substantial evidence on the effectiveness of reminders to patients, our past approaches have some limits. Uh, the effectiveness of reminders has mainly been established for single uh, tasks or a limited set of chronic care tasks. And we have some evidence that when you combine reminders for tasks together, they may be less effective. We also lack the ability to know how to time reminders for different healthcare activities. For example, a mammogram may need to be done in August and an A1C in September. We need to understand when we should be combining these reminders or keeping them separate. So reminders and notifications are closely tied together. A reminder alerts people to schedule medical visits or medical tests, um, screenings, or other chronic and preventive care activities. A notification, on the other hand, informs patients of uh, the results of those activities. So far, our study is mainly focused on the reminder stage. Um, we're also concentrating most on those healthcare tasks that occur more intermittently, often weeks to months between, rather than those tasks that uh, individuals tackle multiple times a day, like taking medications. Our overall goal in the project is to understand the needs and preferences of individuals for healthcare reminders and notifications. And in the initial stage of our project, we're pursuing these questions by going into people's homes and studying the work that they do uh, each day to remember tasks that need to get done. And that, that includes the work not just of healthcare, but also non-health uh, related tasks. And we're doing this by studying a population um, of uh, 40 individuals and families over a series of discovery and design activities. We sampled two different groups to ensure we had a diverse perspective of those managing preventive and chronic care needs. One group was men and women with type 2 diabetes who have other chronic conditions, including at least high blood pressure. And the other group was mothers between the ages of 18, 50, 18 and 50 who have at least, uh, I'm sorry, who have one or more children with active asthma. We also oversampled individuals with racial or ethnic minority backgrounds and those with lower education levels to understand the perspective of those who often experience more barriers to accessing and benefiting from care. We're doing our study at Group Health Cooperative, uh, an integrated delivery system in Washington State, um, which is known for its focus on primary care and engaging patients over its website. We use the methods of user-centered design and grounded our approach conceptually in perspective memory theory and Ed Wagner's chronic care model. Uh, we were also informed much uh, by the good work of those that had already done um, in understanding home health information management as well as the prior research done on the use of calendars in the home. We've learned a lot in the first year of our study, and today I want to focus um, or first share with you the design implications we learned from two different types of reminders used by our participants. One type includes the more traditional reminder tools used in the home and on the go, like calendars, and the other type um, are opportunistic reminders, or reminders that participants find and use from their own world. Our findings on both of these types of reminders give us insight into patients' needs and preferences and capabilities. First, I'm going to talk about traditional reminder tools and how we learned about them. We started our project with a simple question. How do you remember what to do each day? To get to that answer, we had two sequential home visits with our participants. On both occasions, we uh, interviewed those participants, and on one of those visits, we had them guide us around their homes, showing us the various tools and strategies they remember to do uh, their tasks in daily life. 
And then we perform content analysis on the transcription of those visits. Uh, not surprisingly, calendaring was the cornerstone for remembering tasks in most families. But rather than a single calendar, participants were using an ecosystem of calendars uh, and related tools for reminders. This slide shows the constellation of different calendaring approaches. And on the left side are private tools individuals used, and on the right side are the calendaring tools shared within a family. Each row in this table is one participant. The mothers are on the top and the patients with diabetes are at the bottom. Each black square represents a single use of a tool in the home. The green shadowing shows digital tools, and the blue shadowing shows uh, paper or other analog um, tools. So first, notice uh, how most individuals use more than one system. The number of different countering tools ranged from one to six, with the mean around three. Next, notice that the central, in the central column, the density uh, of use with paper wall calendars on the center right column. Um, next to that column, note the high frequency of paper references. These included either papers attached to the calendar or in a pile often close by. Just left of the public calendar column, note the relatively common use of mobile phones for private or personal calendaring, particularly among the moms. We heard from participants that they selected their tools based upon their visibility and how much they trusted the tool, as well as its ease of use. Maintaining these calendars for reminders, participants interacted with multiple external systems to manage their schedules, including patient websites, um, United States mail, and telephone calls. Making these systems um, external to the home work with their own calendar systems at home was often frustrating for participants. In the case of working with healthcare providers and their systems, we heard about the challenges of, uh, of making those uh, healthcare provider calendars work with their own calendaring systems. For example, one mother of a child with asthma who needed regular visits at six month intervals described the situation this way. If I go in for an appointment and the doctor says, okay, we need to see the children back in six months. I usually get home and I'll call the next day even though it's six months out Sometimes their calendars don't even, they're, they're not even that far out. But I call the next day because I might forget. So, well, I'll just call and say, okay, are you scheduling this far out? So, in this case, the mom had several steps to remember, all of which pull on her reminder tools or the ad hoc perspective memory that's in her head. First, she had to remember to schedule the appointment when she gets home. And then if she succeeds in that, she has to set up the appointment. But sometimes the provider can't schedule for that six months, which has to set up a reminder to remind her to call in, in several months to schedule an appointment. And then after that, of course, there's the reminders uh, to remember that appointment itself. And to do all that, a typical mom is juggling three different calendaring tools, some of which are paper and some of which are electronic. Well, so with so many different reminder tools in play, failures were not uncommon. We heard about failures both in the participant's own memory as well as the reminder tools themselves. Uh, perspective memory or that ability to remember in your head um, the things to do in the future was particularly challenged by uh, those comp the competing and continuous demands of daily life. One mother uh, said it this way, if I don't have anything immediately reminding me of it, it's out of my head because I have so much going on. We've got pigs, kids to pick up, drop off, we have cleaning house, I got sewing things, I got to meet people. It's not surprisingly, busy lives make it hard to retain and recall what to do. We also heard about breakdowns in the reminder tools themselves. Sometimes reminders were not captured, sometimes reminders were not retained in the tools, and sometimes participants didn't see the reminder cue or it came at the wrong time. One participant related frustrations of a loss of a paper reminder this way. I was freaking out because I'd actually taken the time to write everything down. They had a trove of information on it. I couldn't find it, and then I was like, how the heck am I going to do this if I don't have the backup? Our participants used several strategies to help mitigate or minimize reminder failures. They made redundant, redundant reminders like this in the, in the top set of photos where one reminder is posted on a cabinet and a separate reminder for the same task is attached to a purse. 
Another participant maintained three calendars in different locations in the home with the same task recorded on each calendar. Participants also used different types of reminder tools. Commonly, a combination of paper and electronic tools like the cell phone and notebook in the second picture. Then finally, participants actively monitored for reminders to minimize failures. This included frequent monitoring calendars, uh, such as a whiteboard calendar uh, in our last picture here. All of these strategies had their benefits and weaknesses. Most all of them, though, required significant maintenance and coordination across the tools. So our results on traditional minor tools in the home had a few important design implications. First, too often the reminders from healthcare systems are adding work at the home that is vulnerable to failure. Healthcare needs to do a better job at weaving reminder tools reminders into tools and the workflows of our individuals and families at home. Next, one size won't fit all. We have to accommodate the variations uh, in our user needs. The, uh, the recent meaningful use requirements to include patient reminders um, are a good step in that direction. And finally, we need to enable detection and response to reminder failures for healthcare tasks in the home. Our participants describe reminders from providers which often lacked an adequate feedback loop to let a patient know if a task was complete or provide a notification of an associated test result. After hearing about the challenges um, with remembering what to do each day, we gained a healthy respect for the complex world our participants managed in their daily lives. But we had not yet heard how remembering healthcare tasks might be different from remembering other healthcare or remembering other activities. And it wasn't until we sent our participants home with Polaroid cameras that we discovered a different and more powerful type of reminder, the opportunistic reminder. These reminders carry the, emo carry the emotional weight of past and present to help them mot and motivate individuals to do the work of living with chronic conditions. And they were the most potent reminders that we found. We used old school Polaroid cameras in a cultural probe inspired activity. We asked pictures to participants to take pictures of what they thought were good reminders in their lives and then describe the reminders that they photographed. In our thematic analysis, participants described some traditional reminders like calendars uh, I spoke about earlier, but they also described how they used reminders that they found in their own world. These opportunistic reminders came in four different types, including reminders that were participants' regular activities during the day, their relationships with other people, artifacts in their home, uh, and amidst uh, their daily routines. Physical artifacts reminded patients both about the actions still to be done, as well as to motivate them through the memories attached to past health challenges. One elderly patient with diabetes took this picture of her cane, um, which you can see is sitting next to her insulin syringes and said, so I took a picture of my cane to remind me of my condition before I started taking my blood sugars really serious. The condition I was in to remind me, you don't want to go back there. Participants also embedded reminders for healthcare tasks in everyday routines. One participant photo provided a photograph of her dog and described it this way, I need to I need to walk to add to my regular exercise classes. It gives me extra exercise by walking my dog. She reminds me to please go on a walk. I would probably not think of walking without her as a reminder. She is my shadow. In other cases, participants found the relationships with people close to them were good reminders. This patient took a photograph of family members and described it this way. I got a picture of my husband and my daughter that lives next door. And they're the ones that got me through my stroke years ago by encouraging me and helping me. While some participants identified family members as providing concrete reminders, such as an upcoming appointment, most identified their relationships as reminders of encouragement for healthcare activities. Our participants' opportunistic reminders have important design implications for how healthcare um, provides reminders to patients and families. First, we need to keep reminders meaningful, tie them to the individual values, 
and where they carry emotional meaning, like the memory of a hard time or the support of a relationship. We should also encourage individuals to reflect on what could serve as a reminder in daily life. Just like our probes, patients may be able to identify routines or artifacts or relationships that could tie both individual healthcare tasks um, as well as to larger aims of health. The power of opportunistic reminders we found was also focused in the home. And as we design reminders for the future, we just should try to bring that power um, into our communications with patients, um, whether it's over the phone or over the internet or mobile devices. Our findings on both traditional and opportunistic reminders complement one another. They show us that reminders for healthcare tasks should have a few key elements. Uh, first, it's worth emphasizing the importance of incorporating the potency of opportunistic reminders into how do we reach out patients, reach out to patients and families to complete common healthcare tasks. And then we also need to make sure we minimize the extensive work of um, the extensive work of um, incorporating into the home environment. And finally, uh, people are using a variety of different reminders tools in home to meet their needs. In healthcare, we need reminder designs which accommodate that variation. These, provide, these findings provide a great foundation for our next steps in the study, where we're going to be developing personas, scenarios, and prototypes. These activities will give us a more detailed specification for how to design better reminders and healthcare notifications. For more information, I've included the references in our study so far here, as well as a couple of references at the bottom for good general reminder design. I want to acknowledge um, our outstanding research team here in Seattle, um, as well as our study participants who um, allowed us into our, their homes and into their lives. And I look forward to your uh, questions later. And I'll hand the, the ball back uh, back over to Patty. Thank you very much. Um, our third presenter this afternoon is um, Patricia Flatley Brennan, who is the William Holman Baskin Professor of School of Nursing and College of Engineering at the University of Wisconsin Madison in Madison, Wisconsin. Dr. Brennan received a Master's of Science in Nursing from the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD in Industrial Engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Well known for her innovative um, with in-home care technology, uh, Patty Brennan now leads the Living Environments Laboratory at the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, which includes a six-sided virtual reality cave that her group uses to recreate virtually every environment on Earth and develop new ways for effective visualization of high-dimensional data. She is a fellow of both the American Academy of Nursing and the American College of Medical Informatics. Dr. Brennan was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2002 and in 2009 became an elected member of the New York Academy of Medicine. Dr. Brennan? Thank you very much, Teresa. And I want to thank Wanda and James for their presentation. They've set up the, the context really well for the work that I'm going to be presenting to you now. The project that I'm going to present to you is a result of the work of a large team here at Wisconsin that we call the Viz Home Team. Our team uh, goal was to develop a context-based health information needs assessment strategy. And our motivation comes from something that won't be ter terribly surprising to those of you. If you look across the red line here and think of this as a year in the life of an individual, we have uh, small uh, uh, perpendicular lines intersecting the red line, and those could be considered healthcare encounters. So in January, an individual has a major event, maybe it's an MI, they go through a series of services with clinical care, rehabilitation, maybe some home-based training, uh, medications that are tagged with RFIDs, and continued conversations with clinicians, imaging studies, and at the end of the year, they're pretty much better but what we noticed and what we know is the medical informaticists in the group are well versed in is that the whole attention to challenging care issues has been focused on those thin little lines, those spaces where the care delivery system intersects with the patient's life. But the patient's life goes on often between the thin lines and we call that space the care between the care. And the slides that you see, the, the two-headed arrows that you see are the space that we're really trying to address right now what's happening in the care between the care. 
and how do we understand this very specifically when we think about the home context. We're guided by several premises. First, clinicians are experts in patient professional practice, but patients are experts in everyday living. So what they need to do to accomplish the care between the care is really more up to them than it is up to us. We heard from James about the reminders and from Wanda about the challenges of information management in the institution, and both of their activities feed into the work that I'm speaking about now because our patients leave our healthcare encounters with lots of little notes and stickies and ideas that they're supposed to remember, and it's overwhelming to them. Healthcare happens in clinics and hospitals, but health happens every day in people's living rooms and bedrooms. And I was particularly impressed with James's idea where we ask pe they ask people, what do they do, not just what do they do for health. Um, what we asked though was where does one uh, do health in the home? And because we believe that where one does health um, actually influences how well it's done. And there's some nice research that's beginning to show the care processes taught in the clinical environment, say medication administration or addressing change, don't always translate to the very familiar but somewhat chaotic life of people's homes. Homes are messy, but private spaces, they're personal and they're intimate, they're meaning to the individual, meaningful to the individual. And so as we bring our healthcare practices into that space, we're challenged by the ideas that people actually have other plans for that space than our healthcare needs. So our goal was to understand the space, but to understand it in a very specific way, to capitalize on emerging technologies to help us better study the home environment. We've been in over 1,000 houses in Wisconsin in the last 15 years. People have been very gracious about letting us in, but we, don't, we know they don't like us there very long or very often. And so our question was, how do we bring a sense of place into the design process? And that's what motivated us to examine this context-based information health information needs strategies, which complements the task-based and the content-based approaches. We wanted to ultimately affect design by creating a place where nurses and engineers, computer scientists, and others could envision every environment on Earth and use that environment to immerse designers into the real world of health and everyday living. We wanted the designers to feel this space and feel the environment. Now, we're guided by a model also in our work, or we happen to be guided by the SEEPS model, the Systems Engineering Initiative for Patient Safety. What you see on your screen here on the upper line is the work system leading to patient processes, leading to outcomes, the familiar Don and Beattie and Triad. In the left-hand box, you see uh, five elements of the SEEPS model, a person in a particular environment or physical space uh, following sets of organizational rules and policies, attempts to accomplish a task in the lower left-hand corner by using certain tools and technologies. Our team decided to explode the idea of environment, move it out of the clinical practice area, and move into the household to understand what is the environment of health when you're in the informal space of homes. So we're looking to find the places where people live. Now, our project is largely premised on the idea of individuals having stable homes, which we know, of course, does not, matter, does not affect at least 5% of our population. We also are focusing at this point largely on adults in those stable homes, knowing that children, families, and extended families are also a very important part of the care system. In our goal to develop a context-based health information needs strategy, we followed actually a five-step process. We want to determine how personal spaces and the orientation of objects in those spaces can affect health information needs. We call personal health information management because we wanted to, uh, to, to separate this from what is clinically driven, that is, what does my clinician need me to do? And also, we wanted to understand it from the perspective of the individual, what do they do to manage their health? So our plan is as follows. We wanted to capture the interior of 20 homes as realistically as possible. We thought we would do this by taking photographs and videos. We've actually embraced a technology called LIDAR. I'll speak more about that in a few minutes, but it is a laser scanning system that allows us to create very precise, full 3D models in full color of a house. We then render those models in an immersive virtual reality cave, and cave does stand for cave automatic vir visual, visual, virtual environment. The cave system that we use is a 10-foot square cave in the, our research institute here that uses coordinated pictures 
and allows an individual wearing specialized glasses to see in 3D, to walk as if they are in the homes of these individuals. This helped us solve the problem of going from house to house repeatedly and also allowed us to capture information once but use it many, many times, which we know is an important informatics principle. We uh, have a, a series of activities involving both first health professionals and then uh, lay people to examine the houses that we have already captured and rendered in our cave and identify the elements, the contextual features of those homes that, that facilitate or interfere with personal health information management. Because houses are very rich environments and because our virtual reality cave and our LIDAR scanner affords us a level of precision, we're actually able to identify a 3D coordinate in space to, to mark the element. Now, an individual can't point to a single spot, so we use something called a beam counter, which you can imagine is like a handheld spray can that marks an area in the home, in the virtualized home, that tells us this space is important for health information management. We will take the list and enumeration of the health information important, what we call hotspots, that have been beamed in our houses by our professionals and our lay people, and then use them to identify a concise and succinct set of indicators or factors or contextual features that shape health information management, which we will then experimentally verify these features and their influence through manipulation. One of the aspects that virtual reality lets you do is remake environments in, in, in with very little complexity. And I'll go into the technical details of how we do that if you'd like to know that more later. <coughs> The last step of our project is to create an instrument that we will, we're calling the assessment of the home environment. The assessment of the home environment scale is going to allow us to identify a parsimonious set of key elements that designers should consider when they're building clinical uh, computerized tools for clinical information and support. But it will also allow physicians, uh, home care nurses, occupational therapists, to have a focal point of where to begin in talking to a patient or a family member about how to, to manage health information in their home. What's known right now is largely known by good ideas and some of the research that we're beginning to do. We hope that by the end of our five-year project, we'll be able to carry out and provide for you this individual assessment guide that should be fairly straightforward to use. Now, we are, like the other teams, have completed about 18 months of our work we have captured 20 houses and have rendered them in our cave. We are now at the point of step number three on this sheet, which is identifying the features likely to influence personal health information management using the bean counter. And that's happening with our professionals right now and with our lay people will be happening in August. Let me tell you in a little more detail a couple features before I get on to our key conclusions from this work. First, I'd like to talk to you about our home scanning process. Listed on this slide are the key members of our team. Kevin Ponto is a faculty member, Ross Trudenik, Naveen Subramanian, and Andrew Moreland are students. Uh, in the image on the right-hand side, you see the LIDAR scanner that we take into a home. It's about the size of a small child or maybe um, a, a small tea table. Uh, we move this around the house, sometimes 10 or 15 times, taking different sets of images. If you can notice the top of the camera where it's yellow and blue, that can rotate 360 degrees in a, in, a, in a horizontal plane and 310 degrees in a vertical plane, thus creating a very dense bubble of points about the house. It takes about six hours to do a 1,700 square foot home, and that generates about 950 million data points. We have put together a processing strategy that lets us visualize those data points it does require the use of our high-throughput computer complex here at the system, and it takes, as, about, as I said, six hours to capture a home and about two full days with intervals to actually do the processing. So right now we're doing something that's not ready to go into industry standard, but in the future we have some visions about how it might. Let me show you what we actually see. In the upper left-hand corner of this picture, you see a photograph of a kitchen. In the lower right-hand corner, you see a rendering of the point cloud from that house in one of our caves. This happens to be a cave that's made from television sets. That's why you see the bezels. But you'll notice that we can reproduce the color of the tea towels and the figures and features that are on the counter, like the, the 
uh, paper towel rack. So we're able to actually come up with a, a fairly clear and clean representation of a home while wearing special glasses and walking through the house then and hearing the story of the people who live in this house. Our experts are now de determining what aspects of that home are helpful or disruptive to health information management. Let me show you a, pic a video that will be a walkthrough of this house. And Sean, if you can begin this video, I'll talk about it. What you're going to be seeing here is a complete computer rendering of this home. This is not a standard video camera, but rather the point clouds. So you see we've just flown through a wall. As we move through this space, you can see in detail the typical kind of household indicators that tell you this is really someone's home. Little bits of clutter here, uh, the kitchen rags being put over the counter. Some, in some parts of this house, as we go up the steps here, you'll see that sometimes the walls disappear a bit. This is something that happens early in our scanning. We've actually perfected our technique, so this doesn't happen quite as much. As we move through the house, we're able to get an experience of proprioception. That is, how big is this object relative to my body? This adds, we believe, a substantial amount of, of tacit insight into what aspects of the home are useful or not useful for health information management. Another aspect of virtualizing houses like this that's particularly useful when you use point cloud is that you can view this house from any perspective. That is, we have an omnipresent perspective in the house, which means you could take the perspective of someone in a wheelchair and move through this house at wheelchair height. You could take the perspective of a child and move through the house at child height. In addition, there are other aspects like allowing two people to view the house at the same time that have become important in our work. This high level of detail we've been able to gather in part because we have a tremendous team who's really skilled at making people feel comfortable even though we're visiting in their homes and going through some places that are really pretty private. We've encouraged people not to clean up before we come and in fact, most people don't clean up before we come. This house that we're looking at now happens to be particularly neat. We have also needed to go back to homes two or three times. And what we know is that things move around in a house. So the jacket that was in the living room now is in the kitchen. Newspapers may move around the table. So we've had to develop some special management of the, of the image data to actually capture and make sure we have a stable looking view through the home. So we, we go to the home sometimes two or three times. We interview the family who lives there, usually using a primary respondent, and we selected people with diabetes also to work with. We ask them about their health information management. Where do they manage, where do they store things? Where, where do they use things? What do they do to get through their day? We use a human factor strategy to do that. Uh, Sean, we can go on now, and I'll do our, my summary slides, please. Um, we are, it, want to bring to you today information about two aspects of this house. Um, one piece of information we want to bring to you is that the, we define personal health information management as the suite of behavioral activities and cognitive strategies used by an individual to record, organize, act on, store, retrieve, or coordinate information. And the act on is a particularly important piece because what we find is that we can see the use of artifacts for every one of these except for acting on. And often people rely on memory to act on information. Um, in fact, with a great deal of pride, they say, well, I don't have to look that up because I remember it. We learned that a house happens all over the house. So the idea uh, that one would organize pills in one single box for the entire day appears to be actually wasteful. What our participants t tend to do, which was a great surprise to us, is they start off the morning, especially people who have many medications, eight or nine medications to be taken at dinner, different intervals. They'll start off the morning, they'll organize their pills, and then they'll move them in little cups around the house to the place they expect to be at the time they take that medication. So morning medications may be taken in the kitchen and day midday medications in the den by the television and nighttime medications in the bathroom. So there was a process of essentially setting up meds and leaving them out. And that does vary, by the way, if there are children or pets in the house. We learned that health happens all over the house. We learned that this process of health happening all over the house means that there isn't the health information center of the house that we thought there would be, but rather there is a highly distributed network. So the idea of creating reminders and recording that events have occurred 
um, has be, is going to be much more challenging than we had expected because the event of using the information is usually located away from the event of either being reminded to use it or documenting that it was done. And finally, sensory cues, not just printed information, aid in personal health information management. We've heard from more than one person that a big cue for them to take a medication or to check a dressing is when the television news, the local news comes on the television at 8.25 in the morning. So they finish their breakfast routine, they finish their morning hygiene, and then the news comes on and that's their reminder, take your pills or take your medication. The same as the sound of the midday fire alarm, which happens in one of our small towns, reminds a person to take their medication. So what we thought would be primarily visual cues turns out to be a very rich set of cues. Our next steps, I'd like to close by just telling you that we've moved on to, to two really exciting new areas with this, in addition to the technical work that we've been doing on managing the, the point cloud data. The first is we've proposed a collaboration with UW Health and EPIC to determine under what circumstances full 3D replicas of the house should be included in the patient record. Uh, we know that we don't want to put all 950 million data points in, but there appears to be maybe for discharge planning purposes or for communication purposes, some value in being able to review a full-scale model of the house and make annotations and record that. So we hope to be beginning a project in that direction starting in late fall of this year. In addition to this, we are also working with the discharge planning teams at University Hospitals here in Madison to determine under what circumstances should these models actually be used during the process of discharge planning and with what type of a computer platform. Is it all right to look at the model on the screen as you did today, or do we have to have someone walk through a fully immersive cave, and how do we make those distinctions? I thank you very much for your time and your interest. I'm very proud to be a part of this team here. My contact information is on the screen, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, we'll now move to the um, question and answer portion of the, our presentation this afternoon. Um, and just a reminder to please, um, with regards to obtaining CME and, uh, and CE credits, um, to please visit the uh, link that's displayed on the slide. And just a quick reminder uh, regarding uh, using the Q&A feature on WebEx to submit your questions. And then with that, um, let's start with some of the questions we've received thus far. Um, this first question is directed to uh, uh, Wanda, and I realize this is not exactly the, the focus of your study, but one of our attendees um, uh, notes that in their area, the patient portal side of the EMR is not updated during the patient um, stay, and she was wondering if you or any of the other presenters knew if this was uh, a universal practice. So um, I know that here within the, the hospitals we're investigating, Virginia Mason does update its patient portal um, regularly, even when the person is in the inpatient setting. And actually, we did encounter patients using that patient portal information during their care. Um, the interesting thing was that some of the clinicians were unaware of the updates to the patient portal and didn't understand how the patients were getting this information or that they were getting the information. But um, in most cases, it seemed like the clinicians were very happy with this particular outcome. Children's, unfortunately, doesn't have a patient portal yet, so we, um, we don't know that information. Um, so I can answer for our one participating hospital from what I've heard. Um, there are a number of other inpatient information needs type um, research projects going on, um, particularly at Columbia. And I know in their setting, they do update the patient portal um, actively while people are in the hospital. Oh, thank you, Patty. Um, another attendee is asking whether um, any of, um, of all the three presenters are is aware of research work on personal health information management in people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, this is Patty. I'm not aware of any, anything specific um, in that area. Um, in order to identify um, patients and participants in an efficient way and actually to be able to 
not burden them with, a, with an extensive data collection. We partnered with a group here at the university called the Survey of the Health of Wisconsin. The Survey of the Health of Wisconsin is a community level random household survey that has over the last eight years brought about uh, 3,000 households into, uh, into its registry. And they run a, a range of basic questions and then some specific ones, uh, including taking some biological samples. Um, the importance to us was, first of all, they had uh, a, a question of does an has an individual ever been told they had diabetes? And that's actually how we identified our population. We did not review medical records to get to the determination. So we, we could have had individuals who have type 1 diabetes. We do not have a way to know that systematically. Um, the second part that's helpful to us, by the way, is that the show community also has a community level survey. So we know things about community assets like the location of grocery stores and bus lines. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, another attendee is wondering whether any of the three projects is um, involving consumer health library contacts as an additional source of information for patients. Uh, this is Patty again. Catherine Arnold Smith is part of our team, and she's actually one of our of our experts who's who's moving, uh, doing the bean counting in the in our uh, virtualized houses right now. They haven't partnered specifically with a library because our focus is less on the content of information and more on the context where it's used. Thank you. Um, and Patty, this question is um, directed at you. One of our attendees is interested in knowing a little bit more about the collaboration uh, with UW Health and EPIC, um, and specifically how, um, whether you approach EPIC directly and in what capacity EPIC will be involved. Uh, so this is a really good question. This must be somebody who knows EPIC really well to be able to ask that question. Um, we actually first uh, presented our ideas about the house as a clinical data element. Um, which is what that project is, is called, to the UW Health uh, Information Systems Group. And um, they in, in brokered the introduction to EPIC. We work with people in EPIC on other projects, but in this particular one, um, our experience with EPIC, I've been here at Madison for almost 20 years, and our experience with EPIC is that they, they, are, they work with you best if you work through a client rather than work with an individual. And so uh, Nancy Smider was the, is their director of research, and Jocelyn DeWitt, who's our uh, CIO, uh, initiated a meeting. Nancy was gracious enough to, do, to pull together a meeting on very short notice with about a dozen people from EPIC. We made our presentation, and the key, and we can go into more details about what the product will look like, but the key issue here is that we, um, we have the, the capability to open a browser window while one's using an EPIC interface with it from the tabs, if those of you know the tabs, and then the view, the, the, the 3D rendering of the home through the browser, um, and then screen scrape the annotations. Um, our work with, with is specifically with UW Hospital. What EPIC is doing is they've exposed their data model. They've uh, basically agreed that UW Hospital, UW Health um, contract with them uh, is, is robust enough to have this project going on. And frankly, they've, they've given us tremendous technical help, EPIC has, and, they've, give, and they, they, they were, they've helped us to think through one of the key problems, which is where would this data be stored if it's not in the electronic health record? So, um, and they actually, in addition to not wanting to have to manage it, they actually could see value, which we were really pleased with, that there may be other reasons to do this. For example, a durable medical goods company might want to see your house so they can help you plan what kind of a bed to put into the living room for your mother. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, and, and another question, um, probably directed at Wanda. Uh, Wanda, an, an attendee is asking whether um, you uh, have learned of effective tools for families to use to communicate questions to providers during their uh, loved ones and patients' stay besides um, whiteboards. Yeah, that's a great, great question. It's one that we're definitely going to be exploring um, very soon in our project. Um, we have seen people use um, some of their smartphones to, to take notes. Um, some challenges we've seen with that is um, 
sharing that information because it's often uh, a care team, meaning not the clinical care team, but actually the patient's care team, spouses, um, adult children, um, parents, those kinds of people who want to communicate with each other um, about not just the questions, but what the answers are. Um, so part of what we're going to be looking at in our grant is exploring what kinds of new technologies will help support them in keeping track of this information and also with sharing it with the, the patient's care team. Great, thank you. Um, and another attendee is wondering if um, any of the presenters know of a survey or instrument that has been developed to assess personal health information management practices of individuals and whether there is a conceptual framework depicting personal health information management activities. Wow. Okay, James, that's yours. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you just leave me the hard one, Patty. I, I, well, I mean, we've certainly got some surveys that we've developed. I don't know of any standardized surveys where you're welcome to, to use the instruments that we that we have developed. We we looked at one that looked at personal health. Um, attitudes towards uh, personal health and then attitudes towards technologies. I don't know of, uh, of a, um, maybe Patty can speak to this too, of a comprehensive framework or WANDA that, that's out there. Um, and certainly in our case, we had to individualize what we were looking for. Um, like, like James, uh, we have instruments that we would be happy to share uh, with individuals. Um, one of the challenges that, that we found is, is, of course, in the language of patients. And so when you talk to people about a, a, a personal health information management, that means absolutely nothing to them. And um, so we listened and we, we, we trained our, our uh, interviewers using a human factors framework. And so we actually do use the SEEPS model, trying to start off first with what is a person trying to accomplish? Um, and sometimes it's, it's as high level as I'm trying to stay healthy or manage my blood pressure. And sometimes it's as, as behaviorally oriented as I'm trying to take, remember to take my 10 o'clock medication before I go to bed. Um, and then using the SEEPS model, we, we sort of build out and probe for things like when, do you, when does that task start and when does it stop? That's probably the, the most important uh, um, a conclusion we've come to is that, that you, 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 you really have to push out the edges of a task to see when they begin and end for a person because uh, our, our standard structure of a series of activities that we say, okay, begin and then we say stop, isn't what goes on in the patient's mind. They start thinking about their noontime medications at 10 in the morning and think about, oh, I have to have some orange juice before I take that or I have to make sure I have food in my stomach. So they, they do a lot of planning kinds of things. Um, we did not... Uh, other than to, to look at three types of information management, which we identified as medication management, symptom management, and other, we did not use a taxonomy. Uh, and I would say um, anyone who has a bright doctoral student that wants to come for the summer and, and, and go through our, um, what we now have is about 75 extensive task analyses with patients uh, in their home, sometimes three or four pages long. We got the data here for you. Great, thank you very much. An answer and an opportunity. All right, um, so um, James, um, can you talk a little bit about how uh, findings from your study could help a provider fulfill uh, patient preferences for reminders as part of meaningful use? Um, yeah. I. I, uh, I think the, the biggest thing is that we certainly validated that patient preferences are, are important. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of primary care practices, too, I think, have some knowledge um, amongst the team members about what they think um, are the best ways to contact patients. Oftentimes, that's not written down and, and shared, I think, amongst the team members as well as they could. And our findings really, I think, clarify how important it is to, to share that knowledge and of, of who people are and when the context of their families when they reach out to remind folks um, of stuff. So to just not make it a, a one-size-fits-all, but really think about the patient and the family. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, that's, that's something I think uh, a lesson from our study right now that, uh, that providers can use. Thank you very much. Um, Wanda, this is 
the research that we fund that technology changes so quickly and research takes time. So can you talk a little bit about how the increased availability of tablets, smartphones, portals, and other emerging technology uh, will impact the recommendations from your work? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Teresa. Um, we're doing this work right now, very recently. Um, we've been doing interviews within the last couple of months. Um, and we've been surprised at how little people are using these pervasive technologies of their smartphones and their tablets in their the healthcare environment. Um, so uh, unfortunately, it seems like even though there are, I don't know how many millions of different um, health apps out there, that doesn't seem to be applying, <clears throat> excuse me, to the, the inpatient arena. I do think that part of the issue is that we just don't have the right kinds of tools available um, to help patients in this um, complex and challenging setting. Um, and hopefully our results will, will point to some of those kinds of things. But more generally, this kind of work, I think that's the value of using these kind of subjective methodologies, is we, we get this rich contextual detail of what patients really value and need, as well as the, the complexities of the situation surrounding them. So if we understand more deeply about what their needs are, that can be de decoupled slightly from the technology that's developed to support those needs. Um, part of what we're trying to get at in our mixed methodology of using a technology probe is the hope that um, once we have um, a piece of technology existing on what's um, available today, um, and have them use that to try and help address some of these needs, that we'll get even more rich and nuanced information about what patients need to, um, to watch out for their safety in this complicated environment. So I, I think that um, anything in health and informatics can be challenging to keep up with the changing space in uh, the electronic world. But um, the kind of work that we're doing from this call, I think, really supports being flexible and really understanding the needs rather than tying it too directly to the technology that's available today. Thank you, Wanda. Um, Patty, you alluded to this a little bit throughout your presentation, but can you talk a little bit more about how um, the study participants reacted to the home assessments? Um, sure. Um, we identified an individual. We have, that we have human subjects approval for our work. Uh, we, when we identified an individual from the, the registry, from the show registry, um, they were, uh, we were able to, they received, the, back up, registry list received a letter saying, um, you've agreed to be on other studies, there's another study that's come up, you may receive a, a, a phone call from the study team, if you would prefer not to, please call us now and we'll opt out. So we had the opt out option first. Um, a couple people opted out. It was a handful. We received over 200 names, and we started to uh, approach people in sequence. Our goal was to, to generate uh, five of each housing type, a single-family home, a duplex, a um, apartment or condo-style multifamily unit, more than four units, and, and mobile homes, or what some people call trailers. And uh, we, were, we were successful in getting at least four of each of those, uh, that getting the trailers was a little more difficult than others. Um, we had uh, we, we we have a fantastic nurse who does our first call to people, and she explained the study, uh, sends them a brief dis written description of the materials, and then at the first visit, which we do bring our scanning team in on the first visit, um, we the patient gives uh, the participant rather gives consent. So they there, and we have not had anyone come to the first visit and then withdraw from the study. We have had people that. Uh, after hearing about the study from the nurse, chose not to. Sometimes we had difficulty with people because they rented apartments and they weren't sure that it was all right with their landlord. There's issues about a legal exposure if something, for example, isn't fixed properly. Um, we did ask people to uh, remain out of the room when the scanning was going on. Uh, we always had two people in the house at each time. Uh, sometimes the conversation was more focused on an interview. Sometimes it was, it was more casual. The interview process, well, it was a toss-up, which took longer, the scanning of the interview process. Um, on our last visit, we always returned with, 
with basically photographs, images that were generated from the scan um, to the individual, and we allowed them to mark anything that they wanted us to redact. Uh, we basically do that by fuzzing out things. You could see that in um, um, in James's presentation where he had family photographs that have been slightly altered. Um, we also allow people to um, uh, uh, to, to move objects in the, in the house as we're scanning. So if they don't want the picture of their grandmother to be in the scan, they can they can of course remove it, and we we work through them with that. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we have not had any problems with people asking us to stop the study in the middle of the study. Um, I think the skill of our team is such that they've worked to make people feel comfortable. And by the way, in our in the course of our study. Uh, our proposal is to create these 3D models of houses, and remember, we're trying to improve design. So we're actually going to be releasing the 3D models uh, on, under an open source license uh, through our internet server at the end of the study. Um, this way, designers and, and other developers will be able to use our models for other studies. So we had to explain that idea. We're not only are, are we going to scan your house, but we're going to put it on the internet. Um, we had no, no, we didn't really have any any pushback from that. We had a couple people ask us for the disk of their um, house so they could have their, the images themselves. It basically like the video that, that I showed you. Um, we actually had to go through our human subjects committee to release that, and the human subjects committee was not very happy about that. Um, we do tell people that they're allowed to have us withdraw the houses from the internet if, if after they think about it for a while they want them taken down, and that can happen any time in, into perpetuity, a person can say, I don't want my house up there. Um, we do have, we have no identifying information. We don't take photographs of the outside of the house. We don't use people's actual names. We don't even use their communities. We, sim we say simply that they're in South Central Wisconsin. And, um, and so the, the, the amount that we've done um, to maintain people's uh, anonymity, uh, we think has been helpful. Um, your question is really prompting me to talk to our scanning team and our, our in the field team a little bit to understand. Sometimes other family members are present; they want to be in the study, they want to be interviewed. Also, our protocol is that we have one primary respondent, and so we've had to develop some strategies that uh, allow the other person to participate, but not as at the level of a, of a respondent. Um, and um, other than, than um, having a significant challenge of people and their dogs, we haven't really had many problems in the field itself in terms of finding places or getting into people's homes. Probably the most significant challenge, and I, I'd like to hear Wanda and James's idea about this, is pay, people are so hungry to talk about their concerns, whether because they believe that um, they can help others with them, there's a lot of altruism, or because they, they just need to be heard that we actually have to work very hard to try to keep the conversation focused and keep the expectations realistic about what we can do for people. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patty, and, and that's an interesting question. Uh, Wanda, James, have you um, encountered a similar issue um, on the field when you're collecting data? So in the inpatient setting, um, We've had a little bit more of a challenge in, particularly in the children's hospital setting, in that um, people are a little overwhelmed and sometimes the duration of stay is quite short. So although a lot of those people are interested in the study, um, a little extra burden of an hour interview followed by observations is a little high for that kind of setting. Um, so I think we, we as researchers need to work on methods and approaches to get this valuable information, but limiting the burden on people in these challenging health situations. Uh, in the adult care setting, we haven't had as much difficulty along those lines and actually have experienced a lot of the same enthusiasm that, that Patty talks about, where people are hungry to talk about it. Um, and sometimes spend considerably more time than we expected in um, telling us about things and showing us things and wanting to follow up even in emails to the, to the research team and, and providing more information and more examples. Um, so we do see some of that level of enthusiasm, but, but um, a little hesitation too in the, the, um, the challenging setting that, that we're looking at. You know, I we 
uh, we've been only seeing a lot of excitement with folks uh, wanting to share with us um, and bringing bringing us into their homes. Um, I think um, there is there is a time limit to that. I think Patty's, uh, and that's part of what, what I think Patty's trying to address is that there's only so much time people do want you there, even though they're really excited to share with you. Um, and uh, you know, we used other methods to try to help engage them outside. Um, the, the photo, the, the homework between visits, the use of the photo where we where we allow patients time away from us um, allows them a chance to share without us actually being there. Um, and that's been a really useful technique. I think uh, having somebody in your home, you tell one story, but when somebody's gone and you have a chance to reflect, you get another story. Uh, in both those cases, folks are really excited to um, to share. It's just um, like us all; we just have so much attention um, we can spend on the intensity of a of a one on one um, engagement. Um, I, you know, the other thing that I think about too is um, it's related to this: is that I, you know, when we recruit these folks, there's a lot of folks that decline us um, and don't share with us. And I think it's important when we um, when we're trying to sample, that we that we try to reach a good sample of folks, and just be aware that we may be getting some some bias in what we're doing, just by those folks who are willing uh, to share, and and some of those who aren't willing to share, maybe um, we need other methods to reach out to those folks to understand, because they may they may be some of the ones most in need. Thank you very much, um, Wanda and James, to, for adding to that discussion. And it's um, interesting to see how um, people's reaction might vary by the type of study and the setting um, and, and, and the focus of the study. So um, we have one last question that came in. And one of our attendees is wondering if there are any standards for health apps for phones or tablets that you know of. I, I know that there's a great hope that there will be, um, <laughs> but I'm not aware of any. Um, certainly, the, the FDA has given some guidance about mobile apps, um, not specifically for patients' apps. They're just general, any kind of mobile app, so that would cover Hippocrates to um, whatever. Yeah, I'm not I, either. I, I think there's still feel like we're in the, in the wild west of... Uh, of this stage of development. Wanda, were you going to add something? I was just going to agree as well. It would be wonderful to have some of those things. I think the big challenge, though, is it sounds nice to have a standard for that, but we all know how there's a huge variety in patient preferences, um, even at the simple level of whether they like to receive emails or text messages. And then you add the complexities of whether they're in the home, what kind of disease they have, whether they're in the hospital, whether they're a child or a parent or an elderly person. Um, and that makes standards um, a little challenging and possibly at some level, maybe even inappropriate. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. I think you have to be careful. You don't constrain innovation that really meets patients' needs. Thank you. And um, we had one more question come in. Um, it, uh, this attendee is, is wondering if you, all three of you, could speak to how you relate your work to health literacy. I'll start with just saying that we, we start with the language that the person uses. And since we're actually not doing um, presentation, uh, we tried of, of content. We tried to make sure that we, we we're comprehending it, and um, it, sometimes it takes a little while to to make sure that we understand that even words that we think are in common parlance, like taking a medication or monitoring a wound. Uh, but it's mostly the, the literacy issues are in the expressive literacy of the person. Thank you. So I think literacy is a is a very important issue to examine, and that's something that we're going to want to that we are we are going to try to look at as as well in our study. Um, I think the more we support patients in their um, personal health information management needs, the the more we support the the variety of people from low literacy, whether it's low health literacy or or low information literacy. Period. 
um, up to even the very highest literacy people, um, having information available to them in a variety of formats, whether that's written form, um, visual form, or audio form, but that's, that's archival and able for them to review at their own time uh, in their own space will be really important. I mean, I agree. I think it's really important. We've tried, um, we've tried really hard to make sure that we're oversampling folks with lower educational level, which uh, has some association with health literacy. And then as we're doing our research, we're making sure that we're trying to best understand um, where patients, not just preference and needs are, but also their capabilities um, and how those associate with the different ways they can receive reminders and notifications. Um, uh, and so far, we're actually seeing some of our assumptions broken down that those folks with at least lower educational levels, many of those folks still rely a lot on digital technologies um, and want digital technologies. So um, so I think it's important to both reach out, but also not to, to make necessarily assumptions about how they may want to communicate through, through different modes, um, whether it's digital or, or, or paper or telephone. Those responses. And with that, I think we'll we'll end our uh, presentation today. I want to thank all three presenters again for um, taking the time for a very interesting discussion and, and conversation. Um, I put up this slide um, with regards to CMEC credits for folks who might need that information. And just a quick reminder to attendees to please fill out the poll that'll come up as you exit the web conference. We do welcome everybody's feedback. Thank you.